Hello, I'm Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz and the author of Recognizing Adult ADHD, which we have on sale right now. You can order. And I'm going to be talking right now today about dosing of stimulant medications and frequent worries about whether the dose is too high or too low. I'll be talking for about 20 minutes. If you have questions while I'm talking, you can certainly type them in. This will also be posted on YouTube as well as Facebook afterwards. If you have questions later, you can type them in then and I'll get back to them. So I have been starting with the take home message first. So the, the FDA does recommend specific ranges of dosages for stimulant medications as it does for any medication it approves. Those are recommendations, not limitations and what you should actually be focusing on both as a patient and as a doctor is that what you're prescribing is or taking is safe and effective for you rather than worrying about whether the doses milligrams sound too low or too high so that's the take home so I'll jump into it so the fda when it approves a drug again is approving presence of a drug or the availability of a drug for doctors. It is not dictating prescribing practices. And in fact, they explicitly say these are guidelines, these are recommendations, these are not meant to substitute for individual clinical judgment. So a little bit about the FDA process for approval. Phase one studies for approving medication involve the safety aspect. So usually at most a few dozen patients people, not even necessarily patients, often healthy control people who aren't, don't have the condition, are dosed first with what are thought to be small doses of a new drug and progressively larger doses until um, adverse effects, what we call side effects, dangerous or bad or unpleasant effects start appearing. And that's used to determine what is considered too much. That does not mean approval of the drug goes always up to what's proven to be safe. That's just establishing the safety range of doses that might possibly be tested in the next two stages for approval of a drug. So phase one, safety. Phase two testing for the FDA is efficacy. So this is much larger population of people with the condition under consideration. So it, for stimulants, it's often AD D is the condition under stimulation or under testing, under study for phase two. And almost always there's a requirement for a control group, a placebo group, and there's comparison usually across a range of dosages, whether the medication is effective for treating or alleviating symptoms of that condition. So those are the efficacy studies. And then phase three studies are usually much more larger number of patients are studied. And again, phase two and three involve patients, not just normal controls. And the phase three, three studies, they're attempting to answer what dosages of the medication are both safer and or, and or. So it could just be that it's safer or it could be more effective than existing treatment options. So if a company does not study a certain dosage range, even if it was found to be safe in the phase one studies, they don't include that dosage range in the phase three, or they may include it, but not even have enough patients in the group. The FDA may choose not to endorse or recommend the whole range of dosages that the company studied. Again, if the company only studies in their dose of ranges, the FDA never in the phase three, at least to my knowledge, never approves a range of dosages broader than what were studied in the phase three trials. And it's at, so at the end of phase three trials, the data is summarized, presented to the FDA. There's a panel of medical experts who are convened to review the data and approve or not approve the medication. Sometimes it's referred back to, we need more studies or we need questions answered. And after a drug is approved, there are often phase four um, studies done. 
And phase four is, is acknowledging that even if you look at large numbers of people, there may be rare side effects or there may be side effects that are, or even benefits that take much longer to show up or, or reveal themselves than we're seeing in the usually fairly short term time interval allowed for a phase three study. So again, the FDA is making recommendations. They are not saying you can't prescribe outside of this limit. And in fact, they're sort of, they are acknowledging that almost everything we look at biologically shows some in human subjects, any variable we look at, any something like blood pressure, something like response to a medication, that there's a usually a roughly bell-shaped curve where most people are responding to a dose somewhere in the middle or have a variable somewhere in the middle. But we know that there are always people at either tail end. So some people are very sensitive and will respond to a very low dose. Some people are insensitive and will respond to a high dose. Or if it's a variable of height or something else, at least some people are very short, some people are very tall. Most people are clustered near the middle. The insurance companies though, and I'm trying not to be cynical, um, but clearly the insurance companies are the business that runs medicine in America, and their major objective is making money. It's not taking care of people, it's not ensuring people's health. If they see a way to ensure health that makes their profits bigger, they may do that. Um, but they often in this day and age restrict access to dosages that sometimes even if they're lower, but particularly if they are higher than the FDA recommendations and often require that the person cite a expert published board that allows or recommends a dose above what's recommended or um, require that you find peer reviewed studies that evaluate the specific dose you're using. Now their claim is to protect patient safety, um, that's highly questionable. I mean, I've seen instances where, for example, with Cymbalta, a drug that for years only came as a 30 and a 60 milligram dose, but the FDA approved in a range up to 120 for several conditions. But for depression, the recommended dose was 60. So insurance companies would not allow two 60 milligram pills but they would allow two 30 milligrams and a 60. They'd allow a dose of 120. They weren't concerned at all about your safety. They were concerned about their costs. So even though this is a real world barrier to treatment and often to getting effective doses, again, that's an artificial construct of our system right now that's controlled by the insurance companies. So again, the, one of the most quest, pom, uh, common questions I see on websites like Quora or ADHD question and answer sites is someone will write in that I'm only taking five milligrams of Ritalin and it seems to be working. Could this be possible? And I'll see a host of people pile on, many of them saying, many other patients saying, no, you couldn't possibly respond to that. And even doctors or other clinicians saying, that's too low, you can't possibly respond. That's a ridiculous way to answer the question. There will definitely be some people, it's not gonna be a big percentage, who will respond to dosages lower than the recommended amount. Similarly, at the other end, there's often people saying, I'm on 100 milligrams or 200 or some number that seems outrageously, ridiculously high. And often they'll pose the same question, is this dose too high? And many of the people answering the question, other fellow patients or clinicians will say, oh my God, that's way too high. When the important question is, what is that dose of drug doing for you? Is it helping and is it free of adverse effects? So to make some of this more concrete, um, for years, the ADD experts said that for Adderall, which is a combination of dextro and levoamphetamine mixed salts that approximately 40 milligrams. So the FDA's recommended upper dose there for ADHD is 40 milligrams. And the expert said about a half a milligram per kilogram should be the largest 
expected dose. So with an 80 kilogram person, which is about 176 pounds, average American I'm sure is above that by now, um, 40 milligrams is considered the maximal dose. But again, there are some people who will need more than that. In my own practice, I've seen people who got full robust responses to five milligrams. And if you tried seven and a half, they felt too jittery. And specifically, I have a guy who's a 300 pound truck driver, clearly diagnosed ADHD, no question that it was some other condition or that he was faking it. Five milligrams Adderall worked for him. Going higher than that made him too revved up, too tremorous, too jittery. On the other extreme, I have worked with two individuals. They were sisters, one who was on 180 milligrams of Adderall a day and the other on 240. They continued on these dosages for years without adverse effects. Um, some genetic testing did reveal they were both fast metabolizers. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but they were sitting there calmly. It helped them be more focused. It helped them complete tasks. It helped address their ADD symptoms. And they were free of side effects. Um, so, again, with Adderall, the FDA recommended, again, those are not strict limits, was a maximum of 40 milligrams. The, most of the ADD experts, if you go online, you can find tools for converting Ritalin dosages to Adderall doses. So Ritalin methylphenidate is a different substance, different stimulant. And most experts would say it's only half as strong. So you would think that about 80 milligrams of Ritalin is equal to about 40 milligrams of all Adderall. Um, but then you'd be surprised because the FDA recommendation for Ritalin is only goes up to 60 milligrams. So again, the recommendations are guidelines to be um, dealt with on an individual basis in terms of what's clin clinically appropriate. Jumping on to, to some other confusion or potential confusion on the Adderall. So again, Adderall is a combination of different salts of amphetamine and amphetamine exists in the natural state as it were or the chemical the naive chemical state is an equal mixture of left-handed molecules and right-handed molecules um, those different left and right so left is called the L molecule um, levo dextro is D or right so the dextro D amphetamine is about three to four times as potent as the L form in stimulating dopamine and or adrenergic systems. Again, these these amphetamine has multiple effects on catecholamines, dopamine, and norepinephrine transmission. Um, so you have to be careful among the stimulants, even among the amphetamine-based stimulants, if you're looking at Adderall or Mideus or um, Edzenis, all of those have about, not about, they have three times as much D, the stronger, more potent amphetamine as the L form. But if you're using straight out dexedrine, which is straight out dextroamphetamine, that's pure D amphetamine. So if you had an equal milligram amount of Adderall and dextroamphetamine, you're getting more of a charge, more of a chemical potency, neurochemical action from the D group because a quarter of the content of the Adderall is actually, it's not zero potency, but it's maybe only a quarter as strong L amphetamine. Um, so the dextro only form, so dexedrine is a D amphetamine only forms, and Zenzetti is a D amphetamine only form, and Vyvanse. Vyvanse gets more complicated though, because even though Vyvanse is only the amphetamine components, only D amphetamine, um, so there's no L amphetamine at all, the D amphetamine is chemically linked to the amino acid lysine, and it needs to be split off, digested from it before the um, D amphetamine can be absorbed and effectively used in the brain. So because the milligramage of 
when you look at a 70 milligram bivalence pill, that's not 70 milligrams of the dextroamphetamine. That's 70 milligrams of lis dexamphetamine, which, and there's different conversion factors, is probably equal to less than 30 milligrams of pure straightforward Adderall. So again, converting between these different forms, separate, even on a straightforward, just in a chemical laboratory way, you, you have to be careful of looking at what actually form of that dextroamphetamine or levoamphetamine you're looking at, and are they linked to other things or other things included in that weight. Also, the general rule of thumb in when switching or converting between immediate release forms and extended release forms is the expectation, it's not always warranted, the expectation is that an individual will use the same milligrams per day. So if they are on three 10 milligram immediate release forms of Adderall, the expectation is that probably 30 milligrams of an extended release form of Adderall would be equivalent. Um, And that is a good rule of thumb. It doesn't always play out. It also gets into some confusion about the concept of half-life. So people use the word, the word half-life in pharmacology means the time it takes the plasma levels, the level in their blood, to drop to half of what the peak was. So half-life, many people use or throw about or interpret it as meaning it's the effective life of the drug. So if someone tells them the half-life of their Adderall is six hours, then their thought often is it's going to last for six hours and then there's nothing working. And again, what the half-life is saying, it's in six hours, it's down to half the level of its peak. At another six hours, it's a quarter level of its peak. At another six hours, it's half of that if it's an exponential decay. And its effective life matters what range of dosages you're going to be responding to. If you actually need to hit that peak or within 90% of that peak, your effective life on the drug may be much shorter than the half-life. On the other hand, if a half dose or even a quarter dose is still having some effect on you, then your benefit is going to feel much longer than what that half-life is. So don't be misled astray by what you think half-life is or what it doesn't really mean. Um, so in real life, what we usually do with dosing for someone who's naive to stimulant medication is, unless they, you know, have had experience with street drugs or other, you know, experimented with something or had a trial in the past where we know it doesn't make sense to start with the lowest range, we usually start with the very lowest dose. And because with the stimulants for ADD, Almost all of what you will see from a given dose is there on a given day, and side effects usually show up right away. It makes sense to start the lowest dose, see what you get. If you have no effect or it's, or it's optimal effect, you should still try that dose probably for two or three days. Partly because with ADHD, we know there's day-to-day -day variability in symptoms for most people. How well they slept is one variable affecting that, but there are clearly others that some mornings someone wakes up feeling firing on all eight cylinders, six cylinders, whatever their engine is, and other days they're just feeling out of it even if they slept well. Um, and that state often persists during the day and it will affect how effective a given dose of medication is. Also, the demands of the day often vary. So if you are having lots of intensive meetings where you need to stay attuned and be ready to jump in with your own input, that may be more um, challenging and more require more help from medication than if you have a series of projects you can work on at your own rate in an undisturbed un atmosphere. So, so we don't usually just settle for one day's results, but try one, two, three days. If you're having no results or minimal results, then it makes sense to go up on the dose. It does not make sense to sit there longer than a few days waiting for better results just by staying there longer. And if with Adderall, if we start at five, the next dose up is 10, 
um, depending on what the 10, if the 10 feels good, that may be reason to stop there, or it may make sense to keep marching up again every two, three days, not waiting for weeks or months because there's not much point in that. So the big question is, how do you know when to stop pushing higher? And there's three different potential endpoints. One in, a, in the real world, what often happens is just a comfort level. I have lots of people who are scared or reluctant to try stimulants. They're just seeing some clear benefit on, uh, say, let's say 10 milligrams of Adderall. They're happy with that. They don't want to even see whether 15 does more. Sometimes they get curious, but so their comfort level says, this is doing something good. I don't want to push it further. Most of the ADD experts, and I would generally encourage some aspect of this, would push higher to one of two other endpoints. So the second type of endpoint is when side effects get in the way. So some experts would say, keep going up on the dose until you see too much agitation, too much tremor, too much appetite suppression, whatever it is, but go up until that dose, then back down from there, and that's probably your safest and most effective dose. Um, so that approach overlaps a little bit with the, the third approach, which is go to the place where you stop seeing improvement. So an alternative to going pushing up to the side effect level is if you see some results at 10 and you see more at 15, but from 15 to 20, you can't really discern the difference, then that would be stopping at the level of no improvement, even if you didn't have side effects at 20. And if 15 and 20 really were indistinguishable, it usually makes sense to go back down to 15. Now, some experts, and I do agree that there is a kernel of truth in this, would argue part of the problem with ADHD is paying attention, picking up on all the information that's going on, and measurably people with ADHD are not accurate measures of how well, how much they're missing. They're not, their ADD interferes with how, assessing how bad their ADD is. Um, so people around them may don't notice differences between say 15 and 20. Their results in terms of how many items they're finishing on their homework or how often they're getting their homework done on time or how long they're attentive in a meeting. We may have objective measures, we may have test measures that reveal that they really are improving, but their own assessment may be that they can't discern a difference. So many of the ADD experts would encourage pushing people up to really a dose that's presumably helping more even if the person can't detect it helping them more. So those are two slightly different endpoints. Again, one is detectable improvement on the part of the person taking it versus the arising arisal of, or of, of side effects. Um, so a little bit about why different people might get different responses. And I go, I'm going over now, why there's such a dosage range. I mean, one is people absorb things differently. People, some people have more acidic or more basic digestive systems. Some people um, have conditions which affect absorption. Some people have conditions which affect how quickly things pass through their system. Um, metabolism is a second big one. We have enzymes that break down certainly most of our ADHD drugs. And if you have enzymes in your liver that chew up drugs quickly, you need a big dose orally to get a substantial dose in your blood. On the other hand, if you are a slow metabolizer, it's possible that a very small oral dose will result in a large level in your blood plasma. So metabolism and many of our genetic testing, um, genome mind and some of the other systems are mostly measuring how rapidly livers break down, liver enzymes break down drugs. And then there's a third issue, which many people assume is the most important issue of what's really going on on the brain. So the assumption is often my ADHD is more severe, therefore I'm going to need a bigger dose of medication. That usually is not a terribly good predictor, because again, what's going on in the brain in terms of, let's say, for example, how many dopamine receptors are really present. Um, 
again, that may have some factor in what dosage you need, but it's usually not the biggest one. So my general message is, yes, if someone's having a response or an apparent response to a much lower dose or a much higher than is recommended, there's reason to sort of look closely at that, but I would take the trust but verify approach. So it's take the patient at their word, but it's worth following up or determining whether they are really getting an effect or whether they really could get away with lower dose if they're on a really, really high dose. But if they're not having side effects, if they're not having adverse effects, it's probably safe to continue. I know with the stimulants, there's a tiny bit of data and a huge amount of speculation that higher doses may put people at more risk for addiction or impedimine-induced psychosis. I would say that the hard data on that is still, we're lacking that. Um, so in general, I would urge, rather than people focusing so much on how many milligrams they're taking, to focus on what it's doing for you. And that's a different version of what I call the quest, not test approach to life. So don't view this as a test. Don't view it as you have to get the right milligrams. View it as, what is my quest? What am I trying to achieve? And I'm trying to achieve improvement in symptoms of ADHD without causing more problems. So that's all I have to say for today. Um, next week is Thanksgiving weekend, so have a good one. I will not be doing a talk. I'll be talking on cardiovascular risks of stimulants in the elderly. Is this a real problem or not in two weeks? So be safe, be healthy. I am not yet seeing any questions, so I'm going to end it right here.